and I have loved picking up that book that you narrated. Those characters are so wonderful. Some of them, like the woman from Scotland, was spot on. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the guy from Taiwan was another one. And <laughs> the villain in the book, that was perfect, where, you know, with the, uh, what was the name, one of the Sopranos, where he was... Uh, Tony, Tony Soprano. Soprano, yeah. yeah. Well, you said in the notes you want him to be a bit like a Tony Soprano, so I watched yeah. a few things on YouTube so as I could get it done. I didn't want to do an impression of him, but I wanted to have the same vibe, and he was fun to do, yeah. He was perfect. <laughs> so, you know, it was... I could not believe it when when all those things came together, and I have the... The Audible version, that was another <laughs> challenge, getting it onto Audible. But, you know, everything came together magically in a way. And you were a great part of that. Fury smoldered within her. She turned from Matthew. In two long strides, she reached the kitchen pantry and grabbed her rifle, the one she kept there, loaded and ready. He watched with a puzzled expression. She came toward him, rifle tucked under one arm, and with her free hand she grabbed him by the shirt collar, pulling him hard, compelling him to walk, struggling behind her. She dragged him along, out through the back door, down the steps into the yard. Never a word. What are you going to do, Ma? His voice sounded pleading, fearful, filled with the sheer terror of her unknown intentions. Ma, what are you going to do? he shouted, begging her to tell him. Stopping dead in her tracks, she let go of his collar, raised the rifle to her shoulder, and took aim at something across the yard. Matthew stood like a statue. His gaze followed the line of the rifle barrel to the only visible target, the big oak tree where Rebel, his Labrador retriever, lay sleeping. Martha knew what she had to do. She took careful bead, unflinching when Matthew cried out, Don't, Ma! He lunged for the rifle, but before he could reach her, she squeezed the trigger. The crack of the rifle echoed across the valley. It was over in an instant. Matthew stood transfixed, frozen. Rebel was so still. He ran to Rebel and pulled the dog into his arms, cradling him gently, tears dropping onto the soft black fur. He kept repeating the name over and over. Rebel! Rebel! As if calling him would bring him back. So whereabouts are you? I'm in Northern California in Eureka. So where is that near? I've been to San Francisco. Oh, this is quite a ways from San Francisco. This is not near anywhere. <laughs> oh, really? Which, what, north, south, east, or west of San Francisco? North. Oh, right. So you're, you're on the way up to, to Oregon, are you? That's right. Headed that way. I've been to Seattle. So I've been, <laughs> I've been a couple of miles, hundred miles on either side of you by the sound of things. Yeah. It's a yeah, lovely part of the world, though. It's, you know, we're behind the redwood curtain is what they call it. Yeah. All the redwood trees are up here. And so we have east of us is Redding. Yeah. And on the coast, well, Eureka is the biggest city probably on the coast right down from uh, Crescent City, which is where the earthquake hit back in 84. <laughs> Well, so you know, you're on the coast then, yeah? No, we're not right on the coast. We're inland. Okay. The coast I've is... been to Fresno. Is Fresno nearby? Oh, God, no. Okay. <laughs> That's way south of us. Okay. You know, just... This is like me asking about what's in, where is Dublin, you know. It's, uh... I see. Okay, from London. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what does it mean behind the redwoods? So that's the that's the trees, and you've got the giant redwoods up there. Well, you behind what do they call it? Behind the redwood, what? 
redwood curtain. Okay, so what does that mean? That means there's a there's a there's a belt of redwood trees, does it, in your one side of it? Yeah, Highway Five goes up from Sacramento, which is the capital, yeah, of California, yeah. and it goes up through the redwood trees, and there are some you know gorgeous roads through here. Yeah. And it's so nice, you know, when we moved up here many years ago, I've been up here for more than 25 years. Yeah. And uh, I've loved it. The weather is astounding. You know, we've been short of rain, but we've certainly got our, our quota in last year. It's been nothing but raining. Right. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, it's like Portland. Right. Okay. So you 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 moved up there. So where are you originally from? The Bay Area, San Francisco. From, from the Bay Area, right? I right. see. And Palo why Alto. did you? Where, whereabouts? Palo Alto. Have you heard it? So that's proper so, Silicon Valley where you grew up. Then. That's right. I didn't right. grow up. Moved there from from Florida. <laughs> okay. So wow, from the other coast. Yeah. I'm and and why did you why did you move to California from Florida? To go to school there at Stanford. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because you used to design ballistic rockets. That was at Eglin Air Force Base. Yeah. That was in the in the back of one of the books. <laughs> so um, how did you get into that business? Well, I, you know, made a mistake early on about careers. Like my granddaughter thinks she's going to be a lawyer and she's having second doubts about it. She's taken up accounting. And so, you know, you, you start out in one direction and you somewhere in between, you realize this isn't right for me. Yeah. And so I was going to be a, a, what do you call it? You know, like a aviation engineer, whatever they they're called. They don't exist anymore. Right. But I went out to um, I got a, I got a quite by accident. I got a appointment to Caltech, and my mother died, and so I went back to Miami to be with her. Yeah. And I took about seven or eight years out and made my way slowly back to California. Yeah. <laughs> so via New Zealand and Australia and you know, we did the we did the rounds there. I love New Zealand. Well I'm and, I'm a New Zealand citizen. I've got three passports, British, New Zealand and Australian. I lived in New Zealand for seven years. And I lived in Australia for six and a half. So did you live there or did you just visit? We just visited, but we we visited more than once. Yeah. And I love Rotorua. <laughs> oh, yeah. Apart from once you get over the smell of Rotorua, it's 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 amazing, isn't it? Oh, I love those bats. It, they didn't smell bad to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a sulfury, it's a sulfury smell because of the it's a bubbling mud and the earth's crust and there's, there's geysers and... Uh, yeah, my wife's a New Zealander. She was born there, and I met really? her in New Zealand. Yeah, and uh, and we bought a house and lived there for a bit, and then we moved to Australia together. And this was back when I was an air conditioning engineer. So talk about career changes. Oh yeah, yeah. And then in Australia, I got into radio, and I was a radio broadcaster for almost thirty years in Australia, and then here in Britain. And then uh, I got into audio books three years ago, and I absolutely love it. I, it's not only the work I love, uh, you know, the bringing the stories to life in audio form. It's meeting the authors from all over the world because you're a fascinating group. In fact, there's no two the same. You, to say that authors are a group is a, is a little bit unkind to how eclectic authors are. And that's all part of what I like about this this work. It's it's just it's just amazing to connect with people uh, around the world who are doing this, who are who are putting their heart and soul and their lives and their inspiration into their books. And, uh, and it is wonderful. 
So what were you reading when you were a kid? What was I reading? Yeah, what, where does the, all the influence come from? Because we want to talk about the Black Swan in a bit, but I just want to see if I can piece together well, where the influence comes from. was my aunt, I, my maiden aunt, who lived until she was 93. She taught school for 40 years in Cleveland, in Shaker Heights. And she sent me... Um, the the works the complete works of the name is <laughs> wasn't Robert Louis Stevenson it was somebody like that okay anyway she sent me all those you know it was Hiawatha and all those stories and I some of them I still remember vividly you know like when it comes to, to present day, yeah. Uh, let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing. Learn to labor, and to wait. You know that was one piece that I sort of remembered. So she had all these little tidbits that I remembered from those books, and we didn't talk about them or anything. But she was, she helped me with math and other things. I went up to stay with her when I was 15 and she was quite an influence. And just before she died, well, it wasn't just before, it was like five years. She left me money that made it possible for me to continue my education. Yeah. So I'm quite grateful to her. So anyway, that was the influence. So right, so I so that was was that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. That's the guy, Longfellow, of course. <laughs> yeah. Now I I made myself sound really smart there, but I did just quietly Google it. But yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. Yeah. Right. So, but you ended up working. I mean, you worked uh, designing ballistic rockets, but then you worked with computer systems in Silicon Valley. How did you That's make right. that change, or, or was it a change? Is there a, is there a crossover between those two types of work? There, there was um, quite a crossover. <laughs> it required a divorce and marriage, and you know, a lot of what's in the the Black Swan was yes, because the Black Swan is set what? in Silicon Valley in in the That's late sixties, right. early seventies, when it was. Was it even called Silicon Valley back then? I wouldn't have, that probably name came probably later, did it? Not too much later. Okay, right. It took Steve Jobs and Apple Computer and some of those other outfits that yeah. uh, that, that made the name stick. Yeah. But it was mostly remembered for the flower children that flocked there in the summer of love. Yeah. So... That's where this story starts with, you know, in 68, 69. So, so were you a similar age to the flower children when you were there? Could you relate? Yes, I could relate. I was, I already become 30, let's put it that way. But I was right there with the crowd. They yeah. were more in their 20s. Yeah, but there was varied ages. And in Poe also, I think somewhere in the book, I mentioned that there was the free university. Yeah. And what I was surprised, I expect to find a bunch of what they were calling hippies. Yeah. And they weren't. They were upper middle class people that were going to these groups. And it was where you could teach anything you wanted as long as people came to your group. If they were interested in the topic, you could you didn't have any grades you know it was an absolutely free university it didn't cost anything so i spent a lot of time there i met some very wonderful people there and they were a lot of them were from stanford so i don't want to connect that too much to the to the book yeah because the the college that i mentioned is called danforth yes and there is a danforth in I don't know, somewhere in the middle of the country, but it's not the name of the university. It's the name of something else. So 
but did you change it to make sure that people couldn't you know accuse you of uh of putting too many That's facts right. in there because the book <laughs> it sets each chapter sets the timeline with what was happening in the news whether that was you know bobby kennedy or nixon or the moon landing or whatever was that was 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 the reason for that to just get the reader or, or in this case with the audiobook the listener into the mindset of the time because it was yeah. an amazing time of change for this especially for the united states yeah it was an amazing time. It was a magical time for me because I had left Florida and after my father died, we were in poverty. And so I dedicated myself. The only way I knew I'd get out of it was to get a scholarship somewhere, yeah. which I did. And, you know, and that's what got me started. And so my first job was at Eglin Air Force Base. And I met my, my actually my second husband I met there and we got married. And with him is where we traveled. We went up to Alaska and went over. He was working for Collins Radio Company. And we took the ship over to Australia and did the whole thing and took the train down I don't remember the. Time. I guess it was like uh, in the southern part, which was colder. <laughs> yeah, in so Australia, anyway, was the train called Australia. the Gan? Was it the Gan? I don't know the name, but I know it was a fascinating ride, and we spent. I guess we rode all the way down there. We flew back, and we landed in San Francisco, and that's where we stayed. And so you said, was it a simple transition? No, we were broke. We'd spent all our money. And fortunately, we had, you know, credit with, uh, you know, some of the credit cards that will give you money for air, airlines and all of that. So we got out on a wing and a prayer. And <laughs> we, we lived at a place that was called Peyton Place West. It was an apartment. No, it was actually called Peyton Place <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that wasn't the actual name but that was the nickname for it okay so anyway the only way i could get work because i didn't i had experience on small computers yeah uh, like a desktop computer that used punch tape and all of that kind of stuff i mean i was in with computers from the ground floor so I had to get experience to get a job on the big 360s. Right. So I went, I went to Stanford and I signed up, but I had been taking, I had been admitted elsewhere. And so this was like six or seven years later and I already had two children. So <laughs> here I was at Stanford in the computer center and the first class was fine. The second class, I had my children with me because I tried to get into the dorms. But in those days, even though you were admitted to graduate school, if you were female, you couldn't get childcare. And right. I argued with them about that. And they said, no, if you're married, you don't need anybody to help you, you know. Women don't make that much money, even if, you know, for the women who help their husbands. So that was a taboo subject. So I had my little kids underfoot while I was key punching. And that was, so I finally had to stop that and, and went to work elsewhere. Yeah. And that was with a big company and it was doing work with the spooks. I had it top level security clearance by that time. So little by little, I worked my way up and the rest of the story is in my book. <laughs> it didn't really happen to me, but it was parallel. Right. So there is a lot of you in the Black Swan. Yeah. The whole background of the time and the people that I met were all different. They're all dead now. <laughs> Most right. of them. Yeah. But, and I, I got all this recorded and I didn't really put it together until almost 2000. And, all right. 
so it's taken a long time. It's been, this book has driven my life in a way. Yeah. And, and then I took the manuscript and I lost the, the electronic <laughs> version of it. So the best I could do is I took the print, the one printed copy that I had, I took it down to got it Xeroxed. But then I made a mistake. I took it to another place and where they do optical character reading to translate it into a form that, you know, for word. Right. Yeah. So it's electronic version. Yeah. Yeah. And the trouble was that they put a whole bunch of extra characters embedded into the thing. And it was on an eight and a half by 11 page. So when I tried to get it on Amazon, I had to get it into a six by nine and that took, oh, that was awful. And let me tell you something else here. There are so many coincidences in this. The latest was I had to have my computer redone here. Yeah. And I found a, a guy that could do it. His name was Garth. Your name is Graham. Yeah. And the guy that helped me reformat the book was Goran. And he was he and Garth knew each other from some kind of business <laughs> dealing, you know, before he even went into working with Lulu and Amazon and all of that. How we found each other, I don't know. And to this day, I don't know how you found me. I know that it was, <laughs> it was, you know, my life has been full of those kinds of serendipitous events. And wow. it doesn't quit. And we all have names that begin with G. You all have names to begin with G. Right. Well, yeah. There's got to be something in that. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you, you were involved in a, in a research program in uh, neuropsychology. You got a doctorate in human behavior, brain function, and consciousness. Did that not give you any of the answers? <laughs> not specifically, but I'll right. tell you, it, it's been good to have that information, especially with the kind of stuff that's going on now because I think we'd all be crazy by now if we didn't understand about that. Really? So it, when we came, you know, I, I did actually divorce my second husband, and then I had another magical experience where I met my soulmate, and we, we were married for 38 years, and he just... I was sure because I was older than he was that I would die first, but he, he died oh, about no. three years ago. Well, you know, that's what the bland's black swan metaphor is about. Right. And when I discovered that work from Susan Anderson, I think wrote the book called the black swan. Yeah. And she talked about this metaphor of abandonment. And the truth is that we, we characterize marriage. You know, we take vows till death do us part. But they don't tell us the rest of it. Who dies first? <laughs> and what happens then, you know? So yeah. that she talks about. So whoever is left because you can be sure that if you're married, one of you, eventually, if you stay together, they either leave or you one dies. So one of you is left behind and you're left bereft. And you have to pick up the pieces of your life and find some way to keep moving forward. Now, not everybody does. Yeah. And, you know, this has been... Uh, remarkable time for me because I would have liked to have just quit. I thought it was all over, but no, I picked up the pieces of my book. So that's inspired me to keep moving forward. Still is. I mean, even getting here today <laughs> has been a challenge. Really? But I, yeah. Because I lost my legs temporarily i hope i'll get them back but you never know so it's hard for me to walk 
I can't drive. I have people here to take care of me, but I can keep writing and I keep, yeah. you know, and I have loved picking up that book that you narrated. Those characters are so wonderful. Some of them, like the woman from Scotland was spot on. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the guy from Taiwan was another one. And <laughs> the villain in the book, that was perfect where, you know, with the, uh, what was the name, one of the Sopranos where he was... Um, Tony Soprano. Tony Soprano, yeah. Yeah. Well, you said in the notes you want him to be a bit like a Tony Soprano, so I watched yeah. a few things on YouTube so as I could get it done. I didn't want to do an impression of him, but I wanted to have the same vibe, and he was fun to do, yeah. He was perfect. <laughs> so, you know, it was, I could not believe it when, when all those things came together, and I have the the Audible version. That was another <laughs> challenge, getting it onto Audible. But, you know, everything came together magically in a way. And you were a great part of that. You know, I, I, you know, I know it was up for auditions, but at the time that you contacted me, I did not think that I could find a male. I had considered, because of the nature of the book, that a male would be much better uh, as a narrator, but uh, I had two women in mind when you contacted me. Uh -huh. And then when I heard your audition, you know, it's the, the rest of the people that, that talk about you, that, that you know, they were astounded that you're so, <laughs> you know, able to get yourself into a part. You know, that's a magical ability that you have, that you can go back and forth between so many books and I haven't listened to all of your books, but you know, you seem to be adaptable to all of those things. That's a great gift. And well, so I thank, thank you so much. I take that as a tremendous compliment, but I always say to the writers that I work with, it's in the writing. I can see the characters in the writing. If it's re if it's well written, the characters jump off the page to me and I go, okay, I know how I'm going to do this Scottish lady or whoever it turns out to be, or the Jamaican lady who was also fun. Um, oh, that was great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so it just, it's just me just playing, just having fun with, with the writing, with the, with what I'm getting from the book and enjoying reading the book and getting from the characters, what's written in there, because there's often, apart from that Tony Soprano one, there's often very little direction in, in, a, in written in a book because usually the reader interprets it the way they want to interpret it. So I, I just like with everybody else, I say thank you for, for writing such a wonderful book and for writing it so well. But in particular, I mean, it's a great story, but in particular, writing the characters so well that there's just such a joy to, to, to play, just to have fun with, you know, that it it's shows, just wonderful. It, it shows in your whole <laughs> demeanor when you talk to your other authors. I was so delighted that there are so many young people that you're helping get started in their careers. You know, I held this back for obvious reasons. Yes. There were, you know, you cannot talk about some of these things. And I wasn't sure that it was, you know, when it would be okay. And yeah. so fiction, I learned a long time ago, was much better than nonfiction if you want to, you know, get your ideas out there in a way that people can stomach <laughs> without lecturing the people. Be because you do deal with some very heavy issues in the exactly. book. Yeah. Very, I mean, you know, you know, we're down to um, um, uh, attempted murder we're we're talking uh, abuse within a relationship we're talking um disputes here there and everywhere the drama in it is incredible does that reflect your actual life or do you have, have you taken a bit of poetic happen. license there yeah those yeah they happen. they happen yeah those yeah. are pretty close to exactly like in the book some of them some of them wow. were not quite, but yeah. the, 
the, the one thing that was exact was the uh, surgery on the animals. Right. And how I did to that. So you worked in a in a vivisection lab and you and you you saw what was going on. Yeah, it wasn't called vivisection. I mean, that was what they called it to dogs and you know the other animals. But this was respected research, and right. it was within the psychiatry department. Yeah, and so it was going on at other companies. My daughter worked for one where they were experimenting on dogs and um, she hated it she left it my son went into research and they were experimenting on bunny rabbits and right. he couldn't stand that uh, and they i tried to get a job at uh, one of the big companies that was no longer doing uh, work with the spooks. I mean, they went through a period after the 60s where they got rid of all of that because it wasn't research. You could not discuss your results openly. They belonged to the government. Right. So they wanted me to, uh, because I had had experiment, uh, experience in that area, they wanted me to put a needle in a monkey's eye and I just, you know, yeah. sorry, can't do that. Yeah. So, you know, it's grotesque to think about what's done to animals. Yeah. So my daughter wound up being a lawyer. My son went into biophysics and he got his PhD at Cornell. And so, you know, they, they went on their own way and, yeah. uh, they were my subject. <laughs> and did you become a vegetarian or vegan as a result of seeing what was going on? No. no, <laughs> no. Okay. Right. You stopped. No, that started much earlier when I was like five years old. Yeah. My mother was going, she took me to lectures uh, on nutrition and health food. And my father corresponded for a long time to a fella in Orlando, Florida, who was a naturopath. Right. So we, we, she started, my mother started um, cooking properly and, you know, training me. And it was like a lot of mommies, you know, you don't eat this, you don't read while you eat, you, you, mix, <laughs> you don't mix certain things and blah, 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 you know. So I, I became quite familiar with that and I was really glad because I attribute my children's health to that information that was imparted to me at an early age which is yeah. when it probably needs to be so a lot of people get into healthy living and it's amazing because I've seen that transformation you know when I was growing up girls weren't supposed to exercise because they'd get muscles and they wouldn't look good and the stuff that we ate was just horrific and uh after my father died my mother ran a grocery store and she kept eating lunch meat that had you know a lot of bad stuff in it and processed so, yeah yeah and all the bread in Florida has sodium propionate in it, you know, to preserve it. And so, yeah, this was not healthy food. And then along about the 1950, I guess, they started setting off these atom bombs, you know, the Bikini Atoll. Yeah, South Pacific, yeah. And in Australia, yeah. Maralinga in Australia, yeah. And that fallout was going everywhere. And we were yeah. getting a lot of it Florida. People were... What, from were, Nevada? The fallout was going from Nevada all the way to Florida? From the Bikini Atoll. Oh, from Bikini all, Atoll was going all the way to Florida. Holy cow. Right. 50 megaton bombs. You couldn't get away from it. Right. It was, you know, depending on the currents and the atmosphere and all that. So what I did, I had just, my daughter had just been born. She was 
still being bottle fed. And so I bought a lot of powdered milk that had been packaged in foil packages before all this started. And I fed her that for two years. And even so, when she grew up, she had a borderline thyroid problem because that stuff lodges yeah. in the thyroid. Yeah. And so fortunately, she never had to take a thyroid supplement, but my husband did. So he took it all of his life. Wow. You know, the, the stuff that you have to take. So, you know, it was, um, that was when we decided to go to Australia. <laughs> right, right. Because we thought we could get away with, from it, you know, yeah. <laughs> not realizing that it was everywhere. It was happening in Maralinga in Australia, yeah, but the whole South Pacific region and then later with the French in Maroa Atoll. It's interesting because, you know, doctors statistically do say that, you know, your health, uh, a lot of it is dependent on your your your, your parents, you know, on, on what, you know, and they'll ask you, is there a heart condition in your family or is there anything in your family? But one of the factors apparently that they don't talk about so much that they're only just learning, a lot of that is to do with you're going to you're gonna eat the same diet pretty much yeah. culturally as your parents did. And you're also yeah. going gonna to grow, grow up in the same environment that they live in, maybe not That's so much right. now as people travel. That is a part of that factor that you know they say oh it's genetics there's nothing you can do about it you know it makes you say oh well you know i'll never have i'm gonna get heart disease because my parents did no maybe you're gonna have heart disease because your parents had a high fat diet and fed you a high fat diet you know what i mean there might be a way around it would it be impolite to ask you how old you are <laughs> i'm in my eighth decade let's put it that way okay okay I'm 80. So that's yeah. you're going good. You're going really good. Yeah. And this Brain story, forward. the black swan, um, with it, how? I mean, I didn't know when I was reading it and narrating it how much of you was in the book. Yeah. Um, but now I know. Wow, what a fascinating time you've been through just to live through those times in America, but to be part of what was going on, to be in California when the flower children were happening, when Silicon Valley was happening, when all this other stuff was happening. It's, it's an, it's, and I like the way you say that by, by doing it as fiction, you can get more in there than if you'd have just done it as maybe as a cold uh, f a fax but would you consider doing a biography do you think so we can fill in the the blanks or is there a reason why it's it, it, it's no, a fiction story I that's biographical biography because i would have to name names and there okay. are family uh most of these people that i knew have children some of them right. have several children they would take exception to some of the things that i described about it because these were careers of respected people yes and, uh, the one thing that i regret is there was a part in there about psychodrama oh and that was another great character that the guy that was uh he was described as walking around the group under the stage lights like a like a rooster and yeah. you gave him a wonderful dialect <laughs> anyway what I was going to say is the one thing that I regret is that I had done a lot of group work like that. I was a typical groupie. I went to whatever was available. And then because I was in the Department of Psychiatry, there were three PhDs that had a grant and they were working on group groups and which was the best one to be in and all of that. So I processed all that data at the main computer, expecting that I would get a good reference from them. Uh, got nothing, <laughs> but that didn't, what, what really bothered me was when it was published, they destroyed that man that was the, this wonderful group leader, that his technique 
you know, they were given pencil and paper tests and the way they interpreted it. Uh, they sort of did a number on him like they do to political people these days, you know. They just make them sound like they don't know what they're talking about. And he sort of dropped out of doing and it was a wonderful thing to go yeah. under the lights. And if I hadn't been through that, I'd have never survived. You know, really? that was you got, you got, that was a lot of help. You, you so it was almost like you, you would go on stage and you would be confronted. Um, and it was quite in the book. It's quite confrontational by some Very certain true. things about life or yourself. And you, you got to respond, but in a kind of safe environment, cause it's on stage. I mean, it might not, but it, it's not, it, it, it's, it's slightly removed from reality. You got a lot from that. Absolutely. And the, the, Going through that experience, it was like when you got to watch other people going through it and hearing their stories and then going through it yourself, it was like living more than one lifetime at the same time. You would never get all of that experience in one ordinary lifetime. And that was why, you know, I went on the last one was a five day marathon. And that was where he told us. Be careful when you leave here because you'll be going 90 miles an hour in a 10 mile an hour world or something like that. <laughs> so you have to really slow down. And that was true. We were all transformed from that experience. I would not undo that. I never would have gotten untangled from my abusive husband if I hadn't been through that. I would not have. I mean, there were lots of people that had been in my life that were not healthy for me. Yeah. And so I had to get through all of that. So it was just uh, being guided through all of this. And I didn't plan it. It just happened, which is magical. You know, I thank whatever gods may be. So, you know. And has, has having that experience, has that made you a better writer? Obviously, it's it's influence for the Black Swan, but but as a writer, as it was the experience good as a, to, to, to ba basically reach down and find out, you know, exercise your demons kind of thing? I hadn't thought about it because it was something that from the get-go, I knew I had to get down. You know, I've only started appreciating all of that lately <laughs> since I've, <laughs> listened, I've been listening to the book and, and reliving, you know, at the end of life, you, you have to relive a lot of these experiences and find a way to integrate them at the end. Yeah. And, you know, or you lose your mind, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I don't want to do or you feel like they're haunting you or something. And some people never resolve some of these things. You know, we, the, the people that, well, if you've done anything with numerology, you know that there are certain steps in your life. And I've reached number nine, which is the culmination. So uh, it's time for me to, you know, sort of put all this in order and hope that there is somewhere else to go after this. And so I've done an awful lot of metaphysical studies as well along with this. Yeah. So it's been an interesting life. I have nothing to regret. You know, they say you regret the things you didn't do, not the things that you did. <laughs> so I plunged into life and I, you know, forced, I didn't force it. It's like the parting of the seas. I went there and the seas opened and I walked in and that was it. So, but the most exciting years were the ones that I spent getting my degree and using what I knew to accomplish that. And yeah. this, this book is still uh, important to me. So it always will be, I think. Was writing The Black Swan, was it therapeutic in a way then? I think if there was any therapy, it was when I started studying. Uh, you know, I didn't start to write a book 
certainly not one that was 500 pages. I thought I could never do that. Yeah. And so what I did was I, I was learning how to write screenplays because I figured I could do that. You know, I'd been in psychodrama and I knew how to put together a scene. And so I took online courses and uh, learned how to structure a lot of things, you know, that I had many teachers because I took several courses. And I guess the, the best, the most difficult thing for me was to learn how to plot. Right. And how do you, how do you write your plot, you know, your outline before you begin writing and structure the, the spine of the story so that I could follow that. And the best guy that I read was Bonnet. I think it's, his first name is James Bonnet or something anyway. It was called Snatching or Taking Fire from the Gods. And his advice was very useful to me, and I still use it. So, and I wrote, the, the first two little books that I wrote were called Anki. And they were based on the work of Zechariah Sitchin, who wrote something like 20 some odd books. And that coincided with the destruction of the museum in Baghdad. So anyway, that book has been the best one that it sold the most. Yeah. And, and then I wrote a sequel to that, which was from a different viewpoint, from the viewpoint of the there were two families, the good guys and the bad guys. <laughs> so um, I wrote it called Queen of Vengeance, which was a hokey title. But anyway, it really was because, you know, you could argue that those people, if they were gods that landed here 450,000 years ago and survived and located gold and did all of that stuff and created, you know, us as human beings that uh, they lived a long time. So one of these gals could possibly still be alive. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if, if you want to go that distance and think, oh, well, they were gods, you know. So I'm not arguing that they were real or anything, but I did enjoy writing about them. And I put together the history that was all the way from, you know, the Carthage and all of those places. And so, you know, I've been a history buff. Yeah. Read the books about Ireland. Yeah. The relationship between Great Britain and, and of course, there was, what was his name, David Icke. Yes. That, called the queen and, and her ilk, the reptilians. <laughs> yeah, know? the family of lizards, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, so it's a lot to, to digest all there at once, but I didn't write about that. But it was interesting reading. And but you finally got round then to to the Black Swan to, yes. to make it more autobiographical and make it, and place it in a time and a place that people... If they don't remember, they certainly know about because that generation, the news from, you know, all the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis and the assassinations of the two Kennedys and Martin Luther King and all that, it, it, is, a, it, it is something that even now is talked about. And the conspiracy over Kennedy and uh, JFK and, and it, it is something that, that places it in, in what is regularly modern conversation that use the time that you've set it in, which obviously is the time that you were there in, in California. Well, I could yeah. see parallels between then and now. It's like, yeah. you know, the history repeats itself. Well, there's a lot going on now for people who lived through World War II, for example, and lived through that Holocaust. And it's a different one now, but there are people that are talking about it. And I was hoping that by putting this out there that some people might see the parallels mm -hmm. between 
then and now because we're going through some very strange and difficult times. I mean, we're going through biblical times now, in my opinion. Mm. So, you know, whether people agree with that or not, I don't care. <laughs> like, you know, that's yeah. my opinion. But what it has given us, it's given us amazing technology, which has democratized writing. And, I mean, because you and I, without this technology, we wouldn't be talking right now, but we would never have got together to do the audio book of the book, to have the book as a digital thing that people can download from anywhere in the world, and as well as the audio thing. So, you know, there are good things going on. And it seems Absolutely. strange that the the, the 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 so you would think that as we progress, and we learn more, and we know more, and we learn from history, things like the Holocaust and whatever, that we would be less likely to repeat those things. But as you said, there are parallels, and history is repeating in in so many ways, and that's really strange considering what we know and the amount of real knowledge that is out there and that can be fact-checked in seconds on a device in your pocket. People st are still getting away with, you know, there are certain politicians who will get away with stuff that they think they can just say it and it's true when it's not. When and it's it can not. easily be fact-checked. Fact Easily. Years ago, when somebody said somebody, some loudmouth in a pub made a statement about something and it wasn't true, you didn't know they might be right. But now you can instantly check. But still, these people still manage to do it. How? You know, it, it, that is the most well, bizarre thing for me. You know. I don't understand how there are so many people out there that just swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Yes. You know, they don't question it they don't they don't have the background or the proper education or something it's hard to know why there are so many people like in a way it's like half of the population is believing this stuff and the other half is not I yeah mean, there are a lot it'll be interesting to see what happens next yeah because it can't go on like this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even in a small way in Britain, we had Brexit. Now, Brexit, we, we're the only country ever, I think, for people to vote to have sanctions placed on our own country, which is what Brexit is. We, yeah. we, they are sanctions. We, are, we now cannot trade the same with our European partners as we used to be able to. We've imposed, we voted to impose sanctions on ourselves. And it turns out that a lot of it was prejudice and some of it downright racism against immigrants. And the politicians who were really our politicians, most of them, are really quite well-educated Oxford and Cambridge dons and lawyers and what have you. And they must have known when people were peddling the fact that, you know, oh, it's because of the Polish immigrants that there's that you've got problems, you can't get a doctor's appointment or whatever it is. They must have known, nah, you know, it isn't. And people who were saying, you know, the, the foreigners are coming and taking all the jobs. We had the lowest unemployment at the time, just before Brexit, when we had the highest immigration from Eastern Europe. We had the lowest lowest unemployment figures so it didn't match up what they what the the people who were peddling this blame the immigrants thing which is part of what brexit was about but the politicians must have known that that was a lie but did nothing to correct the lie rather they went ah so if we stand on a platform of brexit you'll vote for us and keep us in it was really self-centered it was really really scary what they did because they must have known and I don't know about American politicians because I don't know much about American politics, oh, but certainly God. in Britain, a lot of the politicians are really well-educated people who will know what's right and what's wrong, but will just go quiet if it doesn't serve their own needs of, of, of clinging on to power. That's what really bothers me is that people know what are going on, but they're all being, they're all like puppets on a string. And it's, a lot of it is from money yeah. and power. Mm -hmm. You know, these two things, yeah. and they've gone, they go along to get along. So yeah. that's bad. So they're in the process now of unmasking the puppet masters, you know, sort yes. of like the Wizard of Oz, where you go 
<laughs> you find a little man at the computer that's running everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and who are these people? Yeah. Yeah. We need to find out. We need to know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well we we're, we're not you and I are not going to solve the world's problems. We're not going we're not going to do it. All we can do is talk about The Black Swan, which is a wonderful wonderful book. It's out now as an ebook. It's out now as an audiobook because I'm very privileged to I I got got to narrate it. And there are links to the book in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, there are links to Amazon that will get you the book. You can download it, The Black Swan by V.R.R. R. Richards. What's next for V.R.R. R. Richards? I've got another book in the background that has, I've got the first section. If there are three or four sections, I've got the first one written already. I don't know if I'm going to go back to it or not. If I live long enough, I will. But this is about the history into Europe of my family. And I, I, some of it was about the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Mm -hmm. And my, my family, my parents were from Prague. And that was another coincidence. My mentor at Stanford was also from the, the name of the city was his name and it was a coincidence that we met and hit it off and i spent many years in that laboratory with him and he was a remarkable person but he's also dead now but anyway i want to write more about my mother left when she was just six years old she left her grandmother back in Prague and came over about the time that the Germans started torpedoing the boats. And mm -hmm. so she made it over to Ellis Island and her experiences there were horrific. And so there's that and a number of other things. It's a tearjerker. Wow. <laughs> to her in this country and, you know. Oh, you've got to do it. You've got to do it because yeah. it sounds like a wonderful book. But right now, well, best of luck with that. Right now, it's The Black Swan, V.R.R. Richards. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. And thank you once again for selecting me as the narrator for this project. Oh, thank you, Graham. You are uh, next to my heart always for doing this book. You know, you've given me the greatest gift of my life. I really appreciate that. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was just lovely to do. V.R. We'll Richards. Thank you. No. <laughs> What's that? Maybe we'll get to do the next one. If I, live Let, I hope so. I really do hope we can work together again on another one. That would be lovely. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you.